Good morning and happy birthday. For those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ and part of the church, Pentecost Sunday is the day on which we reflect what it means to be the church. It's also a day that we remember the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. As we have been hearing and singing about. Two Sundays ago on May 1st, we celebrated the anniversary of our first worship service in this building. We recalled the discernment and planning and hard work which went into that process. The church which we celebrate at Pentecost in Acts 2 goes back way further than that. It doesn't involve long-term strategies or capital campaign funds. There are no architectural plans or landscaping designs. There's no paid staff or hymnals or instruments. The birth of the church involves people, the Holy Spirit, and communication. That's it. Let's take a little closer look at Acts 2. Reading this passage aloud is basically like hazing for worship leaders. <laughs> Thank you, Scott did a terrific job with that. All of these names, okay, Galileans, we get that one, okay? Jesus was a Galilean, but Parthians, Medes, Elamites, folks from Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, and Pamphylia. Pamphylia? Is that where the pamphlets come from? I don't know, I actually did some sleuthing about this. Pamphylia was a region in Asia Minor, and the name means of mixed tribes or races. And that's perfect, because the whole idea of this list is that it's a whole mix of people. So even within this great list of a mix, there's a mixed up group of people. I believe this list of names and places and tribes is intended to be diverse and a little bit overwhelming. Of course, these names would have been familiar to the first century readers of Acts, but it isn't their specificity which is important. It's the cumulative effect of a list of all kinds of people from all over the known world at the time. Essentially, it's a way of saying there were all kinds of people there from all over the place. Our knowledge of the world and its geography and ethnic groups has expanded a bit since the first century. It would take the rest of this sermon and bore you to tears if I were to try and list all of those groups now, and I would certainly miss some of them. But it might help us to enter into this biblical account if you would consider some of the diversity of the groups of people with whom you interact every day at work, at school, in your neighborhoods. Let me uh, list a few of these. There were Democrats and Republicans, Trumpites, Kasichers, and Clintonians, people who were pro-life and people who were anti-immigration. Or try this. There were Hispanics and Asians and African Americans, people whose parents had been born in this country and many people who were born in other countries. Or there were popular kids and mean girls and jocks and band kids and the geeks who always sat over by themselves. Or there were salespeople and accountants and managers and marketers and supply chain analysts. Tell me if you recognize any of these groups of people. Conservatives, progressives, pacifists, those who are open and affirming, those who think the Bible is inerrant, and those who think women should keep silent in church. Whether you consider these groupings individually or you put them together in one big group of people with whom we interact every day, including Sundays, 
The effect is an awful lot like Acts 2. That is, there are all kinds of people from all over the place. The author of Acts doesn't say that this is good or bad. It's simply a fact of life in first century Jerusalem. Now, enter the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's more like it. We don't know exactly what the coming of the Holy Spirit looked like. Acts 2, 3 describes it as divided tongues like fire appearing among them and a tongue resting on each one of them. One of the joys of preaching on Pentecost is to get to see you all wearing colors of the Spirit and to see those scarves up in the air, uh, just like I got to see a lot of you wearing royal blue a couple weeks ago. As someone who feels that the visual environment of worship should support the words that we are saying and praying and singing, it's really important to me that on this day, we are the visual of Pentecost because we are the church. Not buildings, not offices, not pamphlets, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are the embodiment of Jesus Christ and the mission of God. Not bad for all kinds of people from all over the place. Nobody knows what the Holy Spirit actually looks like. I spent some happy hours surfing around on Google Images to see what kinds of things artists have created. This is an image to which I was drawn. Uh, you might remember seeing it on the front of this month's connection. One image of the Holy Spirit that Roger talked about today was the image of wind. Yeah, wind is a pretty difficult thing to draw. We can see the effects of wind, but we don't actually see the motion of the air itself. Another image is that of a dove. This is an ancient biblical image of God's protection and care, and it comes back again in the New Testament as an image of blessing and empowering at Jesus' baptism. I think there's a suggestion of a dove here. I see one, certainly. But I, like, I think the essence of this image is light and power. This Holy Spirit crackles with energy and has electricity which raises the hair on the back of your neck. This Holy Spirit comes with power. And what does the Holy Spirit give the disciples the power to do? To heal? To forgive? To perform miracles? We'll certainly be hearing about some of that later in the Acts of the Apostles. But this event, the coming of the Holy Spirit to give shape to all kinds of people from all over the place, to become the church, that power of the Holy Spirit is communication. Remember we said the three ingredients of Pentecost are people, the Holy Spirit, and communication. It's probably helpful to step back here a moment and remind ourselves of what has been happening up until Pentecost. The book of Luke and the book of Acts were written by the same author as one continuous narrative that was divided into two books. Think J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings series, if that's helpful for you. Book one is about Jesus' work on earth and his resurrection, and it ends with his ascension into heaven. Acts begins with a brief review and this promise of Jesus Christ. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 2 is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to his disciples. Not just the 11 guys who went around with him for three years, but all of his disciples. 
claiming to be a disciple means committing to be a witness to all kinds of people from all over the place. The power of the Holy Spirit, made visible as tongues of fire, falls upon the disciples and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And what superpower does the Spirit give them? The power to speak in other languages. Now, that's a pretty cool superpower. I have certainly wished I could speak a different language without having to do the hard work of actually learning it. But speaking is only part of the equation when it comes to communication. I believe that on that Pentecost day, the Spirit was present both in speaking and in listening. Now, I'm not sure that the listeners figured out what was happening right away. In verse 12, we're told they say, what does this mean? And in verse 13, they decide it means that the disciples are filled with a spirit, but a spirit of new wine. You don't have to wait for that one. The spirit of new wine and not God's Holy Spirit. I think there's some comedic potential here, which I'm not going to explore today, but it can take the message of God's power a little while to take hold. And I believe that's as true today as this was, as it was in Jerusalem at Pentecost. But when the Spirit takes hold of Peter's listening, it spreads like wildfire. We're not told that tongues of fire rest on the heads of the hearers, but clearly that electric energy of the Spirit is in both speaking and listening. For the good news to be communicated and heard and internalized and lived, we have to commit to both speaking and listening. Notice the great leveling effect of the Spirit's activity. It empowers all kinds of people from all over the place, both speakers and listeners. The limiting factor is not the Spirit's power to enable us to speak or to enable us to listen. The limiting factor is our willingness to speak and our willingness to listen. The Spirit doesn't force us all to speak the same language. Part of the miracle of the Pentecost story is that anyone who chose to listen could hear in their own language. The other part of that miracle was that some people actually chose to listen. All kinds of people from all over the place became the church by the power of the Holy Spirit because disciples spoke and those who were to become disciples listened. 3,000 people became the church that day. Praise God for disciples who witness and listen and become the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you do this with me? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all kinds of people from all over the place. Amen.